Hey everyone, welcome. Welcome to another edition of your midday love break. I'm super excited to have you guys all here with us today. I'm gonna wait for a couple people to pop on. I'm doing this from my computer today, so I'm hoping the connection is okay. It seems to be going a little slow. But as you guys are coming on, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, Steph, I see that you're here. If you can hear me okay, and if the quality of the video is good, give me some thumbs ups. Let me know. I might switch over to a different device. Trying this on my computer today. It's a new, trying it a little bit different today. So just let me know if you can hear me okay, if the quality is good. Otherwise, we might be starting all over. <laughs> so I will wait to hear from you. Okay, we're getting some thumbs ups. Okay, perfect. So Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to have you guys here live. And for those of you that are watching the replay, welcome. So glad to have you here. We're talking about a really hot topic today, one that the majority of the couples that I work with complain about. Um, a lot of just friends and family members also complain about this stuff. And hi, <laughs> I'll be one of the first to admit, like I get into this place of being frustrated around this topic. And, you know, if you have been seeing some of the, um, just like my little marketing images, I've been talking about like what to do when you feel like you're the one who does everything in the relationship. I should reword that. I actually specifically called it how to cope. Because yes, while we're going to talk about things that you can do, I want to start out by just really normalizing the frustration that comes around feeling like you are the one that does everything in your relationship. So starting out with that. Um, for those of you who don't know me or this may be your first time joining, hi, I'm Robin D'Angelo, welcome. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and I'm the founder of The Happy Couple Expert. I'm here in Southern California, Laguna Hills to be exact, and I have made it my mission and it's my passion to help couples really truly like master that messiness of couplehood and create their most epic relationships. And I do that a number of ways with these weekly live midday love breaks, workshops. I work with a ton of people one-on-one -on -one in um, here in my office and I have clients online. So I share that with you so that you know there are so many resources out there. And if you are able to even tune in just once a week to your midday love break and get the tools to create that epic relationship, you're far ahead of most couples. So just keep that in mind. All right, you guys, let me know if you can still hear me okay. Um, it's kind of choppy on my end because I can see myself <laughs> in video. So if for some reason you can't hear me or it is um, hard to see me, just let me know, put it in the comments. Also, just like with these midday love breaks, anytime you're tuning in, if you have questions, put them in the comment section. I will do my best to answer them live. If I don't get to them, because I typically have a lot of information I wanna share with you, I will go back to answer those. So please make sure to put your questions in the comment section, um, or you can even private message me with your questions. So one last thing before we get started. Um, everyone on my email community knows about these topics first, and they're actually the ones that are writing in to me and saying, Robin, you know, we're really struggling with this topic in our relationship. Would you mind talking about this next week on the midday love break? Um, yes. So I really want to encourage all of you to head over to my website, www.thehappycoupleexpert.com. There's a little freebie there. It says, download the Epic Love Playbook today. If you get that, which is kind of fun, it's in the season of football, you will be automatically added to my email list. So you'll be the first one to know about what are the topics that we're going to be talking about on the live feeds. You'll be the first one to hear about um, events, live events that I'm doing, online events, all that good stuff. So join my community and be the first ones to get the goods on creating an epic relationship. Okay, let's dive in. And I have my notes here to keep me kind of right on point because you guys, as you know, I am such a big love geek that I could talk about this stuff for days. So I'm trying to keep it about 30 minutes. Um, put your questions in the comments as we go. So today I wanted to talk about, you know, how to cope when you feel like you're the only one who does everything in the relationship. And I mentioned um, 
in some of my emails that you may have heard it be referred to as like an emotional labor or the mental burden. I have been reading so many articles recently that talks about like this mental burden that women kind of go through their lives with. And I want to talk about that today. I want to talk to you guys about the research behind that and <clears throat> how it shows up not just at work, but at home and in our relationships too. And then lastly, I'm going to talk to you about what you can do about it. So just for your guys' information, the term emotional labor was actually first introduced back in, uh, I believe it was 1979. And it was really more about like this idea of putting a smile on your face, even if that's not what you were feeling. And it was really noticeable <clears throat> in the working place, specifically in service, um, like, you know, service industry, which meant the majority of those in the service industry were women. Typically, right? You're thinking about hostesses, you're thinking about servers, you're thinking about um, airline flight attendants, you're thinking about people at the front desk doing things, um, a secretary, right? So it's anyone who, you know, you go in to get your mani pedi done, and it's usually a female doing it. So it's someone who is typically giving, like being of service. That was back in 1979. That's what this is based on and this research. Heather, I sound great. Okay, good. Glad you can hear me. Um, so this goes back to 1979. And the reason people started looking at this is because they were talking about, okay, are you really that happy <laughs> when, say, you're like, have such a great day, bye-bye, to the person checking out? Even if they were impatient, maybe they were rude to you, right? Maybe they were downright discriminatory to you. Um, and so people started looking into this, which is like, what's the deal with these women that can just show up and still have like this sweet little smile on their face? So that's where it kind of originated. And then they started looking at, you know, what women were starting to talk about amongst their friends, their complaints, what they considered relationship dissatisfaction and what contributed to that. So again, a lot of this goes into like the gender stereotypes. So I just want you guys to know that I know this can feel really frustrating to hear, but I will say it right now, based on the research, the majority of the people, and I'm talking, and I'm, I'm really stereotyping right now. So it's in heterosexual couples, one male, one female. Um, there are some studies with same-sex couples um, I didn't have time to pull all that up, but I can definitely put resources if you guys are, are curious. Um, but they talked about the majority of the emotional labor falls on the woman. The majority of it. And I'm going to talk to you guys about why that is. And I'm sure for those of you women that are here today, you're probably like, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> duh, Robin. But let's talk about not only why, but let's talk about what that looks like. Um, I'm just kind of looking over my notes. Oh, it was so funny. So I was reading about this um, professor of communications and science at Penn State. Her name is Dr. Michelle Ramsey. And she talked about, you know, that emotional labor used to be looked at as like problem solving. And she said that, you know, the gendered assumption is that men are better problem solvers because women are more, more emotional which is kind of hysterical and kind of funny because as a woman, I know that I'm solving problems all day long, whether I'm at work or I'm at home, whether I'm a parent or I'm not, whether, you know, it, all these things, right, ladies? Like I know for those of you that are here, you're like, yes, you're solving problems all day long. And that's kind of what the research started to show. It was like, yeah, but who's actually solving the bulk of problems, both at the workplace and at home? <laughs> Again, just sharing the research with you, with you guys. This isn't anything that I feel biased. Um, either way, all I know is my experience, and then I know the research. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the brain. I'm going to geek out on you for a minute, but I think it's important for you guys to understand like, why it is we do what we do. Um, because it's not always a matter of choice. It's not always a matter of, well, you know, you're just being, you're, you're a jerk or you're just being lazy. 
so I want to talk about the brain a little bit. And again, I'm just going to reference my notes so I make sure to explain this clearly. And as we're going through, you guys, if you have questions, put them in the comment section. If I don't have the answer right now, I will definitely get back to you. But I want to talk about this idea that typically, again, gender stereotyping, men are wired to be more linear thinkers. Linear, right? So typically, a man's brain is wired to think, okay, what is the most efficient way from point A to point B? And you do that. Um, there was actually a study that was looking at how men and women look at websites. And they were, um, there's things like called heat maps and there's click trackers so they can see what it is that men, or women, women, men and women are looking at on the website, where they're clicking. And there was this study where they gave men and women the same instructions. Go to this um, website, it was a cooking website, find this recipe, click on the recipe and email it to yourself. Well, what they found was men would go in, they'd scroll, they'd look, they'd find the recipe, they'd click on it, and then they'd be done. They did exactly that. They went in, found the recipe, sent it to themselves. What did the women do? <laughs> the women went in, and they were actually looking all over the page. They were looking at the advertisements on the left. Um, they were clicking on a couple other areas of the website before they got to their recipe that they were instructed to find and then email themselves. They found some other recipes that they were like, oh, but I like this too. And I'm gonna email that to myself before I find mine because I don't wanna forget. <laughs> it's so funny, right? And I'm sure a lot of you are listening going, oh my gosh, I probably would have done the same thing. So it just shows that like our brains are wired so differently. Um, so when you think about our brains and the way that they're built, um, there's two areas that I wanna talk about. One is the amygdala um, and one is the hippocampus. Hang in there with me, even if you're not a brain geek and a neuroscience geek, it's going to help you um, just gain a better understanding of you and your partner, maybe just of you. So um, in men, their amygdala is actually bigger and the amygdala is actually responsible for get this regulating emotion regulating emotion and a lot of you might be thinking wait a minute that doesn't make sense let me tell you why this makes sense being a linear thinker and being able to effectively and efficiently regulate your emotion helps you avoid distraction Oftentimes we think about men being these um, single focused creatures. And this goes back to like primal days, right? So caveman days, what was the man's job? Typically, the man's job was to go out and hunt and bring back meat, right? What was the woman's job? Again, typically, you're staying in the village, <laughs> right? Holding, holding down the fort, literally, which means you're keeping an eye on the kids, you're watching the pot of water that's boiling over the fire, you're chopping up you know, veggies, um, you may have to go out a little bit into the field and get berries, but not just berries, you have to find the dark red berries because the light red berries are poisonous this time of year. I mean, it's literally all these things that we have to keep straight in our minds. And we have, you know, the old saying, like mom has eyes in the back of her head. <laughs> it's because we are wired to be constantly scanning for everything, <laughs> for the details. So men are single focused and they put all their energy into the one task and doing it really well to completion. And then they can move on to the next task. We as women, we like to like pride ourselves in, I think, that we can multitask. Oh yeah, I can do a million things all at once. Unfortunately, the research is showing us while we might be doing a million things all at once, we're not actually doing them as efficiently and productively as we could be. So the quality of our work suffers because the quantity of our work goes up. With men, the quantity of what they're doing goes down, the quality goes up. If this is too much like brain geek stuff and geeking out on you guys, let me know. I find this stuff fascinating. It helps me to helps me to um, have empathy when I start getting frustrated with my own partner. So, um, so I want to talk about the female brain a little bit because we ladies, our hippocampus is actually bigger, and the hippocampus is actually responsible for learning and memorizing, 
which means long-term memory, okay? Men are really good with working memory, so that means in the moment. So if they were in, say, a board meeting, and their boss were to say, okay, you know, talk me through this process that you guys just got done doing, a man's brain can typically, like, rapid fire, this is what happened, and then we did this, and then we did this, and giving all these accounts. The female brain is really wired to go back in time and recall details. And this is where we really um, do well when it comes to remembering that forever long to-do list. Getting to the idea of I'm the one that does everything in the relationship. I'm the one that when I walk in the room after a long busy day and I, I, I scan the room, does the dog need to be fed? Do I need to, you know, pick up the shoes that have been left in the middle of the room? Oh, look, there's still dishes from last night. Oh, and literally our eyes are just scanning, right? Is this making sense to you guys? Does this resonate? <laughs> Do any of you find yourselves doing this? Like, and then getting frustrated because either there's your partner sitting there watching TV or taking care of something that just has to do with them. And it's like, how did you walk right over this box that's in the middle of the room? How did you not see that and think maybe I should put it away, right? Like, so I want you guys to understand that our brains are wired so differently. Typically a man will, you know, come home and have one thing on his mind. Like I need to get home and do this one thing, whether it's get home, take my shoes off and sit and relax for a minute, whether it's get home and take a shower, I need to get home and go for a run, whatever it is, you have like this thing on your mind. You're not distracted by the shoes left on the stairs as you go up them to go into your bathroom. You will step over them. Your brain's not looking for them, which means if your brain's not looking for them, it may notice them, but it doesn't say, oh, pick those up and go put them away because you are a linear thinker and you're saying the most efficient and productive use of my time is from A to B. And so they have a really great way of not getting distracted where us as women get distracted and we think of it as like, well, how did you not see that? I read this really cool article and if any of you guys are interested in any of the articles that I'm referencing, put a comment in and I can totally um, put the links in here. There's so many fascinating articles, I love it. And someone said, you know, men systemize and women empathize. Men systemize and women empathize. And the reason this is so important to keep in mind is because when you're scanning your room or you're scanning your brain for your to-do list, you're thinking about all the ways it's going to impact other people, your family members, your mood, maybe other people's moods, maybe what they do with the rest of their day. Like you're empathizing. You remember if men are actually better at regulating emotion, it means they know when to tap into it. Whereas us as women are kind of always tapped into that, that empathy point. So a lot of times we're keeping others in mind. So when you think about, you know, I'm the one who does everything, I want you to think about why that could be. And we've talked a little bit about the way our brains are wired, the way we're set up, the way that we think about things. So this is a really big hot topic, especially when the holidays come up, right? You're going to need your partner's help. You especially are going to be like, okay, I either have to kick it into superwoman gear and really, you know, I call it the GSD mode, right? It's get shit done. I got to get shit done. And it's going to take me more time to explain it to my partner. So I might as well just do it myself. But then what happens? The resentments build up. You feel tired. You feel unsupported. You feel let down by your partner. So I want to talk to you guys just about a couple things that you could do as you're getting ready for the holidays, I mean, it's a big time of year these next couple months. It's a lot of stress. It causes, I can't tell, <laughs> most therapists, you guys, most therapists talk about, oh, it gets really slow around the holidays. Couples therapists, <laughs> it ramps up during the holidays because people are like at their wits end and they just need the support. So one thing I do wanna say to you guys is this. 
if you have a partner who no matter how many times you ask, no matter how many lists you make, no matter what you do, it seems like they forget what you've asked. They start one thing and then they maybe start another thing and then you're like, oh my God, how, how did you leave this drawer, drawer open? You finished the task, but there's like scissors left everywhere, right? They get distracted, it feels kind of chaotic. I want you guys to think about something. So many times I meet with couples where that person, the one who is easily distracted, the one who says, I'm really trying, I'm so sorry, but I forgot. Guess what? They may have ADHD or they may have those traits of ADHD. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That's a whole nother talk and I could go into that forever, but I wanna give you guys a resource. I'm gonna show you. It's probably going to be backwards on here for the video, but it's a book that has changed the lives of so many couples. So whether this is for you or a friend or a family member, go check this out. It's literally called The ADHD Effect on Marriage. Understand and rebuild your relationship in six steps. This is what it looks like. All right, you guys, take a screenshot of me if you want. Yay! <laughs> this is what the book looks like. Check it out. Share it with your friends and family. And it could really, really help. Even if your partner may not be diagnosed officially, but it's like, this is kind of how they show up. Check out this book. So here's what I want you to do. Write this down. These are the things I want you to do if you find yourself feeling like I am the one who does it all. First of all, take a breath. Just take a breath. And I want you to know that I see you. And I want you to know how, that I know how exhausting it can feel, how lonely it can feel, and how unappreciated you can feel. All of that comes with feeling like you're the only one in any situation, okay? Especially in one where you're supposed to have someone there helping you carry the burden, the mental burden, the emotional labor. So I just wanted to start with that. First thing I want you guys to do, start making lists. Um, I actually just, <laughs> It's funny, I brought, I, I essentially, or I, I initially wanted to do this topic because I found an article and I just loved it. And then I started noticing that I'm like, man, I kind of feel like I'm the emotional labor, like superhero of my family <laughs> and I'm tired of it. And I started getting annoyed thinking about it, which is hysterical because that very day, it was just on Monday, I was thinking about this, you guys, guess what happens? I get a text from my husband because he leaves for work before I do. So I'm still at home and he says, hey, babe, it's going to be a really hot day today. Make sure to turn the air conditioning, you know, uh, up so it's a little bit warmer so it's not running all day. Make sure the dog has plenty of water. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. He's doing the things that I think he doesn't do. I don't think he thinks about this stuff. And it was just such an eye opener for me. I'm like, I am not the only one who does this, which is those thousand tabs open in my brain of, okay, don't forget that when I get home, I need to make sure to stop by the store and then I need to do this and then we need to together. So it was a really nice reminder. Just like today when he, before he left the house today, he said, hey, we're getting ready to go on a trip. Send me a list of everything that we need to do tonight. Just send me a list. I'm like, okay, great. Make lists, you guys. And it doesn't just mean here, husband, and you treat them, or wife, and you treat them like a child. Here's what you have to do today. But it was a comprehensive list. I want you guys to make comprehensive lists. These are all the things that we either need to do before we leave, or that would help me really enjoy our trip if we got them done beforehand. And it's a list of everything. It's a list of everything for both of you guys to do. And the next thing I want you to do is I want you guys to delegate and just say, um, you know, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and take these first three, you do the next two, like break, let's go, let's come back and then we'll like check out the list again. Make sure that these things are time limited and time sensitive. 
our brains, um, well, there's this thing called um, Huntington's theory. Have you guys heard of this before? Give me some thumbs up if you guys have heard of this. Huntington's theory is we will take the amount of time that we give ourselves to do a task. We will take up all that time to do it. So say you have an hour and you have like, I want to make sure to clean the bathroom. All right, I have an hour to clean the bathroom. You'll take that full hour because you will fill it up with other things. Or you will take your time or, or you'll pop on social media and you'll start scrolling. However, if you said, I'm going to set a timer and I'm limiting myself to 30 minutes to get the bathroom cleaned, your brain says, okay, let's get on it. Let's do this. Let's quickly go through our mind, create a system, and go. You have 30 minutes. That's Huntington's theory. So think about making that list, delegating, and making things time sensitive. And then almost like, okay, break, let's go. <laughs> we'll come back and we'll see where we're at. We'll reassess and then we redelegate. This sounds overly simplistic, you guys, and it, it is simple, but I know it's not easy. So hang in there because the way you guys talk to one another and have patience for one another and are kind to one another throughout this process really impacts not only the way you experience this like teamwork, whether you're under the same roof or not, you're like maybe one's running errands and one's at home doing things, but it impacts the way your brain experiences the situation. And that, that really truly shows up the next time you have this situation. So here's something else I want you guys to think about. The things that I feel like I'm doing everything with, I do it all, Robin. <laughs> I bet you do it. I bet you do most of it. Are there certain tasks that you can actually hire out? I have to tell you that my life changed the day we hired um, help to clean our house. It changed. I wasn't always angry if the house was was if there was dog hair on the floors because it wasn't as much I wasn't feeling like I just can't do it all how many times have you thought that to yourself oh my god I, I just can't do everything I'm wiped out <sighs> I so hear you see what you can hire out and if that means pulling back on a couple of the fun expenses for the month just to see what it would look like and feel like, just to see how it impacts your mood, your quality of life, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your family. Do it. Check it out. Um, and the last thing I want you guys to do, like I said, like educate yourselves. Maybe there's more to it. Maybe there's more to your partner's distractibility. There's more to your partner's, for you know, um, inability to remember, their forgetfulness. Maybe there's more to it. So check into this book, like I said, The ADHD Effect on Marriage. It's phenomenal. Um, and I just, I want you guys thinking about like, how can we do this differently? Because when you feel like you're the only one planning all the dates, you're the only one taking care of all the household chores or setting up house, you know, events and holidays and planning, like there is another way. And just know it doesn't change overnight. You've got to start putting systems in place. And guess what? Going back to what I said in the beginning, men systemize. They do really well with systems. So if you can create a system together and find out how they can best be a part of that, it's win-win. And nothing's going to be perfect. <laughs> Please don't expect like a miracle and overnight. But I, I want you guys thinking about how can we start making these minor tweaks. And gosh, you guys, it's 1230 already. We've gone 30 minutes. I've been getting a lot of like, this makes sense. Oh my gosh, I've been there. Yes, yes. I'm glad this has been helpful for you guys. If you have any questions, specific questions, because I talk in generalities on these, but if you have specific questions, I want you to put it in the comment section or email me so that we can talk further. I want to make sure you feel like you can actually take this stuff into your relationship and start making changes. 
because there is no reason, there's no reason to continue to be frustrated day after day, week after week, month, year after year, decade after decade in your relationship. Life is too short, my friends, to go that long without loving big. <laughs> so, all right, you guys, I just want to make sure that this has been helpful. I want to make sure you guys feel heard and seen. And go back and watch this because a lot I give you guys a lot of research. I understand that. I give you guys a lot of the, the brain geek talk, the neuroscience behind it. But maybe share it with your partner. Maybe share it with someone who could um, benefit from hearing this information. Maybe it will benefit their relationship. And I'm hoping, more than anything, it benefits your relationship. So if you guys want to hear more about this or if you guys want to talk more about this and have specific questions answered, please reach out. Um, and if you have any other topics that you are looking for very specific help with, reach out. I would love to either bring on a guest expert to answer your questions or come on live and answer your questions myself. Again, I don't claim to have all the answers, but it is my passion to help you master the messiness of couplehood together and create your epic relationship that lasts. So you guys, until next week, mwah, big love, go love each other. Bye.